Welcome back, Dr. Milo Wolf today with you, PhD in sports science, reacting to another scientist's takes on fitness. Now, as I understand it, Andrew Huberman's expertise lies within neuroscience. I haven't actually listened to this podcast basically ever, but I know that he gives out information when it comes to fitness as well. And as that lies more so in my purview, I thought it'd be interesting to see what he has to say about fitness and see whether or not I disagree with it given that my expertise falls more squarely within that field. Without further ado, Exercise Scientist reacts to Andrew Huberman right now. There are a lot of reasons to want to get stronger. And I should just mention that it's not always the case that getting stronger involves muscles getting bigger. There are ways for muscles to get stronger without getting bigger. However, increasing the size of a muscle almost inevitably increases the strength of that muscle, at least to some degree. Reasons why most everyone should want to get their muscles stronger is that muscles are generally getting progressively weaker across the lifespan. So when I say getting stronger, it's not necessarily about being able to move increasing amounts of weight in the gym. Although if that's your goal, what I'm about to discuss will be relevant to that, but rather to offset some of the normal decline in strength and posture and the ability to generate a large range of movement safely that occurs as we age. As I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, we just tend to lose function in this neuromuscular system as we get older and doing things to offset that has been shown again and again to be beneficial for the neuromuscular system, for protection of injury, for enhancing the strength of bones and bone density. So there are a lot of reasons to use resistance exercise that that extend far beyond just the desire to increase muscle size. So far, so good. Lifting weights does stave off sarcopenia, which is one of the many unfortunate consequences of aging and is generally associated with worse health outcomes. And lifting is a very effective means of preventing sarcopenia. Sarcopenia essentially being the age-related muscle wasting disease. Equally, and I'm not sure what he's about to claim here, but just because you're trying to stave off sarcopenia does not mean that you necessarily need to deadlift 500 pounds or 600 pounds or 800 pounds. Like the health-related benefits of lifting weights even as far as preventing sarcopenia go, likely don't have much to do with you going from a 300 pound deadlift to a 600 pound deadlift and have a lot more to do with you being able to lift 300 pounds in the first place. You don't need to be a freak of nature to be healthy is what I'm trying to say. And I think just some lifting goes a long way when it comes to longevity. I have a whole video on lifting for longevity somewhere up here. With just an hour or two of lifting a week, you do see some pretty meaningful improvements in health. So... It's worth keeping in mind that you don't need to be a freak and you don't need to relentlessly pursue greater strength numbers and greater strength numbers. And ultimately, the way I logically wrap my head around this sort of idea is that your survival doesn't really depend on your ability to lift 500 pounds or even 400 pounds or even 300 pounds. It mostly is contingent upon, are you generally healthy? Are you able to get through most of life's daily tasks without struggling too much? As you age, are you preserving that capability to the greatest extent possible those boxes are kind of ticked you don't need to worry about anything else as far as lifting goes so yeah if someone comes to me and says i want to lift for longevity i don't put them on a program to maximize their lift i put them on a program to generally gain some muscle and get stronger but once they've reached that there's no need for them to go to the gym seven times a week so there's an important principle of muscle physiology called the henneman size principle and the henneman size principle essentially says that we recruit what are called motor units. Motor units are just the connections between nerve and muscle from a, in a pattern that staircases from low threshold to high threshold. What this means is when you pick up something that is light, you're going to use the minimum amount of nerve to muscle energy in order to move that thing. Likewise, when you pick up an object that's heavy, you're going to use the minimum amount of nerve to muscle connectivity and energy in order to move that object. So it's basically a conservation of energy principle. Now, if you continue to exert effort of movement, what will happen is you will tend to recruit more and more motor units with time. And that process of recruiting more neurons, more lower motor neurons, as if you recall from the beginning of the episode, these lower motor neurons are in our spinal cord and they actually dump uh, a chemical, acetylcholine on muscle, cause the muscles to contract. As you recruit more and more of these motor units, these connections between these lower motor neurons and muscle, that's when you start to get changes in the muscle. That's when you open the gate 
for the potential for the muscles to get stronger and to get larger if that's what your goal is. And so the way this process works has been badly misunderstood in the kind of online literature of weight training and bodybuilding and even in sports physiology. The Henneman size principle is kind of a, a, a foundational principle within muscle physiology, but many people have come to interpret it by saying that the way to recruit high threshold motor units, the ones that are hard to get to is to just use heavy weights. And that's actually not the case. As we'll talk about the research supports that weights in a very large range of sort of a percentage of your maximum anywhere from 30 to 80%. So weights that are not very light, but are moderately light too heavy can cause changes in the connections between nerve and muscle that lead to muscle strength and muscle hypertrophy. What he thinks he's saying, what he's saying here, I think are different here. Uh, he's essentially going against the claim that heavier weights generally lead to earlier recruitment of higher threshold motor units, which is true. The higher the first production requirements, the earlier your highest threshold motor units will likely be recruited. So that is true. But equally, what he's trying to say here, I think, is that when you fatigue, your body will inevitably have to recruit those higher threshold motor units as well. So I think I agree. I'm just not 100% sure he's expressing himself correctly. Now, I'm sure the power lifters and the, the people that like to move heavy weights around will say, no, if you want to get strong, you absolutely have to lift he heavy weights. And that might be true if you want to get very strong. But for most people who are interested in supporting their muscular such that they offset any age-related decline, in strength or in increasing hypertrophy and, and strength to some degree, there really isn't a need to lie about the Henneman size principle, which many people out there are doing and claiming that you absolutely need to use the heaviest weights possible in order to build strength and muscle. So I'm going to explain all how all of this works in simple terms. Bam. Who hurt you, Hubi? I didn't realize people out there were lying about Henneman size principle, odd thing to be lying about. Um, but yeah, I agree. If you're just concerned about staving off sarcopenia and generally age-related declines in size and strength, totally. You don't need to lift 90% of your max all the time. With that being said, with him earlier mentioning increases in bone mineral density as a result of lifting, it is worth noting that those adaptations, to my knowledge, are relatively strongly related to the weight you're lifting. And so higher intensities, heavier weights are meaningfully responsible for increasing bone mineral density and making your bones stronger in a way. So I agree for the most part. It's just worth noting that the research on bone mineral density is divergent with his recommendation here. Everybody has imbalances in how muscles can grow, how well muscles can grow or how poorly or how challenging it is for their muscles to grow. Now, Many people who are afraid of like getting too bulky, for instance, are afraid of lifting weights. But I think the research shows now that everyone of pretty much every age should be doing some sort of resistance exercise, even if that's body weight exercises in order to offset this age-related decline in muscle contractile ability, muscle strength, et cetera, improve bone density. There's nothing good about getting frail and weak over time. And people who invest the effort into doing resistance exercise of, of some kind, whether or not it's with bands or with weights or with body weight, really benefit tremendously at a whole body level, at a systemic level, as well as in terms of muscle strength. Agreed. I think specifically as you age and as your risk of having sarcopenia increases, lifting is definitely a good idea. I don't think everyone needs to lift, although I do think that there is probably a benefit to be had as far as muscle strengthening activities and bone strengthening and so forth goes. But I agree by and large, yeah, it's all the bless. You can just kind of march across your body mentally and see whether or not you can independently contract any or all of your muscles. So for instance, if you are sitting in a chair or uh, you're standing, see whether or not you can contract your calf muscle just using those upper motor neurons, sending a signal down and deliberately isolating the calf muscle, okay? If you can contract the calf muscle hard to the point where that muscle almost feels like it's trying to cramp, like it, it hurts just a little bit. You know, it might, it's not gonna be extremely painful, nor is it gonna have no sensation whatsoever. Chances are you have very good upper motor neuron to calf control. And chances are, if you can 
isolate that, what they call that brain or mind muscle connection, and you can contract the muscle to the point where it cramps a little bit, that you hold a decent to high potential to change the strength and the size of that muscle if you train it properly. Now, if you have a hard time doing that, chances are you won't be able to do that. If, for instance, you focus on your your uh, back muscle, like we all have these muscles called the, the lat, the latissimus dorsi muscles, which basically are involved in chin-ups and things like that, but their function from a from a more of a kinesiology standpoint is to move the elbow back behind the body, okay? So it's not about flexing your bicep, it's about moving your elbow back behind your body. If you can do that mentally, or you can do that physical movement of moving your elbow back behind your body and you can contract that muscle hard, chances are that you have the capacity to enhance the strength and or size of that particular muscle because you have the neural control of that muscle. Man, I, this might be entirely out of my purview. So if I speak mistakenly here, my bad, I'm putting it up front that this is not my expertise, but I haven't seen any research linking uh, an individual's ability to contract a muscle to their growth potential in extreme circumstances, like in the context of paraplegia or something like that, I could certainly see it playing a role. But in the context of an untrained person not being able to contract their lats just standing there, does that make them less prone to growth? I don't think so. And in fact, as long as you're exposing your muscle to tension throughout one of its functions, like for example, for a lats, that would be something like a lat to pull down or what have you. As long as you're actually exposing it to tension and performing one of its functions, it will grow. I can't say that I've seen any research suggesting or confirming what he's saying. It just seems like a very weird thing to harp on as one of the only things that you mentioned about lifting weights. And in fact, even the importance of the mind-muscle connection as something you need to focus on during lifting is not super clear yet as far as enhancing hypertrophy. The one study we have looking at hypertrophy from focusing on the mind-muscle connection as opposed to an extrinsic cue or an external cue rather, like focusing on getting the weight up simply, so in this study by Rat Schoenfeld, they compared two groups. One group focused on feeling the muscle. It was the cue used was squeeze the muscle. And the other group, they focused on getting the weight up. The cue used was get the weight up. They performed the same training program. There was greater hypertrophy noted in one of the muscles measured for the mind-muscle connection group. In the other muscle groups measured, and in terms of strength outcomes, differences of anything leaned in favor of the group focusing on the extrinsic cue of simply getting the weight up. So overall, not a slam dunk in favor of the mind-muscle connection. And so it just seems weird to me that he's harping on this so much, but maybe I'm mistaken there. If anyone knows of any research, please do comment down below letting me know. Everything about muscle hypertrophy, about stimulating muscle growth, is about generating isolated contractions, about challenging specific muscles in a very unnatural way. If you, whereas with strength, it's about using musculature as a system, moving weights, moving resistance, moving the body. The specific goal of hypertrophy is to isolate specific nerve to muscle pathways so that you stimulate the chemical and signaling transduction events in muscles so that those muscles respond by getting larger. So there's a critical distinction in terms of getting stronger versus trying to get muscles to be larger, hypertrophy per se, and it has to do with how much you isolate those muscles. Muscle isolation is not a natural phenomenon. It's not something that we normally do. When we walk, we don't think, okay, right calf contract, left calf contract. No, you just generate those rhythmic movements. And of course, there's no reason for them to get stronger or larger in response to those movements. Let's say you were to do a, a kind of strange experiment of attaching 30 pound weights to your ankles and you were to do those movements. Well, if you weren't specifically co contracting your calves in each step, there's no reason for the calves to take on the bulk of the work and you would distribute that work across your hip flexors and other aspects of your musculature. Your whole nervous system seeks to gain efficiency. It seeks to spread out the effort. By and large, I agree. Strength is specific and it involves the coordination of multiple muscle groups at once to execute a task. Whereas hypertrophy is ultimately just about exposing a muscle to tension and leading to a molecular cascade of events that causes hypertrophy. So they are distinct adaptations, though generally, as I mentioned earlier, making a muscle larger will also make it stronger. It's all about trying to generate those really hard, almost painful, localized contractions of muscle. Now, of course, how much weight you use in order to generate those contractions will also impact hypertrophy. But I think most people don't really understand the mind-muscle connection. It sounds like a great thing, but it's actually 
one of the things you want to avoid if your goal is simply to become more supple or to become stronger. You want to do the movements properly and safely, of course, but it's the opposite of hypertrophy, where with hypertrophy, you're really trying to make that particular muscle, sometimes two muscles, do the majority, if not all the work. Whereas in moving force loads, in trying to generate activity of any kind, like lifting a bar or doing a chin-up or something, those so-called compound movements that involve a lot of muscle groups, if, they're, if your goal is to be better at those, you want to avoid isolating in any one particular muscle. Now, I know this probably comes across as a kind of a, of a obvious duh, especially to the um, folks that have spent a lot of time in the gym aimed at uh, getting hypertrophy. But I think most people don't appreciate that it's the nerve to muscle connections and the distinction between isolating nerve to muscle connections versus distributing the work of nerve to muscle connections that's vital in determining whether or not you generate hypertrophy, isolated nerve to muscle contractions versus strength and offsetting strength loss, which would be distributed nerve to muscle connections. I think Andrew is making a common mistake here, uh, which is to kind of dichotomize or categorize specifically in discrete fashions, strength adaptations and hypertrophy adaptations. Whether you focus on a muscle connection or not, you will see hypertrophy. Whether you focus on the outcome of the movement or an external cue, like for example, get the weight up, right? You will still see hypertrophy and strength adaptations. These things tend to happen simultaneously. Can you preferentially elicit an adaptation in strength versus hypertrophy? by training in a certain way or by focusing on a certain cue during the movement? Yes, potentially. Specifically with regards to the movement and the repetition ranges used and the intensity used, you can certainly preferentially target strength versus hypertrophy. But to make them seem as though they are these very distinct, disparate adaptations that rarely occur alongside each other, in fact, focusing on one makes you lose out on the other one, it's not very true. There's a lot of information saying that you need to move weights that are you know, 80 to 90% of your one rep maximum or 70% or cycle that for three weeks on and then go to more moderate weights. There, there are a lot of paths. As, um, as some people say, there are a lot of ways to, to add up numbers to get 100. You know, there's a near infinite number of ways to add up different numbers to get to 100. And what's very clear now from all the literature that's transpired, and especially from the literature in this last three years, is that once you know roughly your one repetition maximum, the the maximum amount of weight that you can perform an exercise with for one repetition in good form, full full range of motion. I'll be in touch, Andrew. Mention full range of motion in your podcast again and we're going to have a problem. In the 30 to 80% of one rep maximum, that is going to be the most beneficial range in terms of muscle hypertrophy and strength. So muscle growth and strength. And there will be a bias. If you're moving weights that are in the 75%, 80% range, or maybe even going above that 85 and 90%, you're going to bias your improvements towards strength gains. This is true. And if you use weights that are in the 30% of your one repetition maximum or 40% or 50% and doing many more repetitions, of course, then you are biasing towards hypertrophy and what some people like to call muscle endurance. But that's a little bit of a complicated term. Agree and disagree. Agree that if you're lifting heavier, closer to 80 or 90% of your max, you will see greater strength adaptations. A recent preprint by Swinton and colleagues looked at this, and generally, the, the heavier you lift, the better it is for maximum strength. For hypertrophy, you're not biasing hypertrophy more when you go lighter. Uh, you see the same hypertrophy if you take a set to failure, whether you're lifting 40% of your max or 80% of your max. You're not getting any additional hypertrophy by going lighter. I'm not sure if he meant to say that or if I'm misunderstanding, but I just wanted to mention it. And there's all sorts of interesting nomenclature that's popping up all over the internet, some of which is scientific, some of which is not scientific about how you are supposed to perceive how close you were to failure, et cetera. But there are some very interesting principles that relate to how the nerves connect to the muscles that strongly predict whether or not this exercise that you're performing will be beneficial for you or not. For individuals that are untrained, meaning they have been doing resistance exercise for anywhere from zero, probably out to about two years. Although for some people it might be zero to one year, but that, those are the so-called beginners. They're sort of untrained. For those people, the key parameter seems to be to perform enough sets of a given exercise per muscle per week, okay? The same is also true for people that have been training for one or two years or more. What differs is how many sets to perform depending on whether or not you're trained or untrained. So let's say you're somebody who's been doing some resistance exercise kind of on and off 
over the years and you decide you want to get serious about that for sake of sport or offsetting age-related declines in strength, the range of sets to do in order to improve strength, to activate these cascades in the muscle, ranges anywhere from two, believe it or not, to 20 per week. Again, these are sets per week and they don't necessarily all have to be performed in the same weight training session. I will talk about numbers of sessions. So it appears that five sets per week In this 30% to 80% of the one repetition maximum range, getting close to failure or occasionally actually going to full muscular failure, which isn't really full muscular failure, but the inability to generate a contraction of the muscle or move the weight in good form. I'll go deeper into that in a moment, but about five sets per week is what's required just to maintain your muscle. So think about that. If you're somebody who's kind of averse to resistance training, you are going to lose muscle size and strength. Your metabolism will drop. Your posture will get worse. Everything in the, in the context of nerve to muscle connectivity will get worse over time unless you are generating five sets or more of this 30% to 80% of your one repetition maximum per week. Five sets is probably a decent estimate for this sort of thing, but I wouldn't stay as a hard and fast rule. I think you can probably maintain muscle on even fewer than that for some people. Three to eight sets, maybe even three to five, it's probably fine. Typically, we observe maintenance of muscle with reductions in training volume of like 70% in the literature, which would be close to this about five set figure. He mentioned that going close to failure was important for both hypertrophy and strength. Maybe he'll come back to this, but for hypertrophy, it is reasonably important. Uh, For strength, probably not so much. For strength, it's predominantly the amount of weight that you're lifting that matters. Long term, you'll still probably want to take some training close to or to failure for hypertrophy as a means to increase muscle size. That would then potentiate increases in muscle strength, but hey-ho. Now, that's just to maintain. And then there's this huge range that goes all the way up to 15 and in some case, 20 sets per week. Now, how many sets you perform is going to depend on the intensity of the work that you perform. This is where it gets a little bit controversial, but I think nowadays most people agree and Dr. Galpin confirmed that 10%, not to be confused with the 10% uh, we discussed earlier, but 10% of the sets of a given uh, workout or 10% of workouts overall should be of the high intensity sort where one is actually working to muscular failure. Now I say not true muscular failure because in theory you have a concentric movement, which is the kind of lifting of the weight. And then you have the eccentric portion of muscle contraction, which is the lowering and eccentric movements because of the way that muscle fibers lengthen and that sliding actin myosin that we talked about before, you're always stronger in lowering something than you are in lifting it. But the point being that most of your training, most of your sets should be not to failure. And the reason for that is it allows you to do more volume of work without fatiguing the nervous system and depleting the nerve to muscle connection in ways that are detrimental. So we can make this simple, perform anywhere from five to 15 sets of resistance exercise per week. And that's per muscle. And that's in this 30 to 80% of what your one repetition maximum. That seems to be the, the most scientifically supported way of offsetting any decline in muscle strength if you're working in the kind of five set range and in increasing muscle strength when you start to get up into the 10 and 15 set range. Broadly agree, the five to 15 set range is cool. The 10% rule is entirely made up. Uh, I have no idea where you got that from, but there is no research for that effect essentially. Generally, when you're closer to failure, you observe more hypertrophy. Does that mean you should be doing exactly 10% of your training to failure and the remainder not to failure? I don't know. I don't think so. I think it's lacking nuance, but he's ultimately communicating to a super wide audience of mostly people with no idea about lifting. So I think it's fine. Could be better, but it's fine. Okay. If you have muscles that you are very good at generating force within, it's going to take fewer sets. Now, how many sets? You are going to have to determine that. It's going to depend for those of you that are using like 50% of your one repetition maximum, because you're doing a lot of repetitions, you might find that three or four, five sets will maintain the muscle. You might decide to do that once at one point in the week and then do it again, right? So if you're going for 10 sets a week, you can divide that among two sessions. You can do that all in one session. The data really show it doesn't matter. There are some you know, differences in terms of whether or not you're trying to generate maximum intensity within a workout or whether or not you want to spread that out. But in general, resistance workouts of any kind tend to be 
best favored by workouts that are somewhere between 45 minutes and 60 minutes and generally not longer than 60 minutes because that's when all the uh, things like cortisol and some of the inflammatory pathways really start to uh, create a situation in the muscle and in the body that's not so great for you. So it's not a hard and fast rule, you know, that the ax doesn't drop at 60 minutes. I'm glad he mentioned it's not a hard and fast, fast rule, but he just kind of uh, but was very alarmist about sessions last, lasting longer than 60 minutes. There's a million ways that a session could last longer than 60 minutes and still be better for hypertrophy and strength development. So don't worry if your sessions take longer than 60 minutes. That's one thing I have to correct here is that there is no compelling evidence to make this statement. I do want to mention something very important, which is that everything I'm referring to here, it has to do with full range of motion, okay? And you might ask, well, what about the speeds of movements? This is actually turns out to be a really interesting data set for generating explosiveness and speed. So for sprinters or throwing sports, or for people that want to generate a lot of jumping power, it does appear that learning to move weights as fast as you safely can, especially under moderate to heavy loads, can increase explosiveness and speed. And most of that effect is from changes in the neurons. It's not from changes in the muscle, it's from changes in the way that the upper motor neurons communicate with the lower motor neurons and generating a pathway, a neural circuit as we call it, that is very efficient at generating action potentials, which are the electricity within neurons to trigger the muscle. Now, of course, there are events that happen from nerve to muscle, but the takeaway from that enormous literature, frankly, is that if you want to get faster, yes, it can be beneficial to get stronger. But if you want to dedicate resistance training specifically to jumping higher, to running faster, to throwing further and these sorts of things, that learning to generate force with increasing speed is going to be beneficial. On the flip side of that, for people that want to get stronger, it appears that the slowing down of the weight as things get harder is a key parameter in recruiting those high threshold motor units. So let me phrase that a little bit differently. Think about a set in the gym or think about a set of push-ups or a set of pull-ups. Initially, you can move very fast if you like. If you want to generate hypertrophy, the goal really is not necessarily to move super slow, but to isolate the muscle and therefore not to use momentum rather than lift weights, as they say, challenge muscles. If you want to get stronger, you're going to be distributing that effort over more muscles and more of your nervous system. For generating explosiveness and speed, it's very clear that learning to generate forces quickly and to move heavy or moderately heavy loads quickly is going to be beneficial because of the way that you train the motor neurons and of course changes in the muscle. But this could look different for different sports. And obviously you want to make safety paramount. If you're injured, you're not going to be able to train at all for sport or for any purpose that is. And so what this would involve is something like 60 to 75% of a one repetition maximum. And then in a controlled way, moving that as quickly as one can throughout the entire set and certainly not going to failure because as you approach failure, the inability to move the weight with good form, the weight inevitably slows down. And so it's really only for purposes of hypertrophy that you really need to be concerned about how quickly the weight is slowing down. However, if you're trying to get faster, more explosive and generate more speed, and jumping power, throwing power, things of that sort, you never really want to use a weight or get to a portion of the set where you're moving the bar very, very slowly. And I'm sure as I say that, some of the exercise physiologists and advanced trainers out there will come after me with pitchforks, which is fine. I'd love to see the literature that shows that low gear, slow movements with very heavy weights can indeed improve uh, explosiveness. And that may in fact be the case, but the data that I was able to access uh, was essentially as I described just a moment ago. He's very defensive. Um, yeah, I agree with him by and large. Like, I think if you're being, if you're trying to be specific to your sport of choice and your sport of choice involves lots of high-speed explosive contractions in your training in the gym, it makes sense to be specific to that training as well. Anyways, that is going to wrap up my review of Andrew Huberman's um, advice on lifting weights. Let's put it that way. Unfortunately, this podcast didn't feature his famous description of, uh, it gives you a lot of pop and hop as well, presumably. A tremendous amount of hop and presumably pop. Okay. Too. Wow. So, huh. But it was actually pretty solid. Memes aside, I think this was mostly solid information. Some of the finer points he may not be perfectly clued up on, but by and large, pretty solid. I would give him like a six or seven out of 10. I don't think much of the advice given here was 
super practical. I think some of it was made up, like the 10% rule about train to failure, but by and large it was correct and good enough for a beginner whom he is most likely addressing ultimately with his podcast about a variety of topics, some of which you might know more about and some of which you might know less about. That is a video. If you enjoyed the video, please comment, like, subscribe. Let me know who else you want to see me react to. If you're looking for a coach, check out the link above and I could become your coach. And I'll see you guys, my subscribers, in that next one. Peace.